All right, I'm gonna have a little fun today and I'm gonna show you some of my troubleshooting learning moments. So uh, to start off with, you'll notice there is no car in the garage. I better fix that. All right, here is my 1978 280Z. The last time I showed you a little bit more of the outside of the car, this time I'm gonna show you a little bit more on the inside and more specifically the engine. Uh, this car came to be a little extra crispy. I'll have to find a picture and I'll add that in here. But uh, in about 2002, it had a little bit of an engine fire. It burnt pretty much everything north or toward the front of the car from the windshield. Now you'll notice here, here's the standard L28 engine. Uh, nothing really special about it, except for a little bit what's on the other side. And those are all LS coils. So you'll notice here, distributor, I've got it right there, but no plug wires are running from it. Everything is being handled by speed window, and it's being taken care of that way. As far as it goes, you also notice the idle air valve, chilling right there. It's got a dead end or a dead head style fuel rail. Notice there's no return curve that goes all the way back. The uh, fuel pressure regulator is sitting, um, well, right there. And you'll notice it just tees off the main line, right actually over here. And so that's how it works. It's a dead head style. If you're curious about that, I can always do a little bit more. As far as it goes for the idle air valve, the idle air valve is connected to the, uh, basically the crankcase vest vent be down below. So usually what happens is the PCV, or sorry, positive crankcase ventilation up here, this should actually be more drawing air in, going through the engine, and then ultimately coming into the idle air valve. So that helps kind of vent the crankcase, keep, uh, some of the issues that come from a non-vented crankcase out of the air and uh, also keeps emissions down a little bit and helps me out in that regard. Gets a hair better gas mileage supposedly by doing it this way, so also another try I did there. Here's where it comes into play. Under here, under the cam, I have a 24 minus two tooth wheel in there that I've made, welded together and put in there. Nothing really special about it. I did run that for quite a while. You'll see the hall sensor that's kind of sticking out of there. But you'll notice if it runs over here, that one's unplugged at the moment. The only one I have plugged in is this one right here, and that goes down to a 36 minus one tooth down there at the bottom. I made the bracket. I've been running that weird bracket now for, um, oh goodness, uh, probably six, 7,000 miles, no issues yet. Um, but that's essentially Kind of the nuts and bolts of this. It's got uh, pretty long collector headers. You'll see there's the collection point down there as it gets close to the transmission. It's got a unique sound. It's two and a half true exhaust all the way through. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some unique things that happened as I was troubleshooting Speedwino. I'm gonna get my laptop. I'll talk about a few things I learned when comparing it against Megascore and the install I did on that years ago. All right, so I've got the computer set up, and one of the things I want to do is talk about some of the default kind of quirkiness inside of Speedwino. And I like, kind of like them. Um, but when I came from Megasquare, I didn't know what to expect in that regard. And a lot of them with sensors. I struggled for a bit with another project with my brother-in-law on a 620 Datsun. So an old school pickup truck. We kept having an issue, it would start and run, but it wouldn't drive, and that was because one of the sensors went to what we refer to as a default value. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Here I've got 
Tuner Studio pulled open. More specifically, take a look at the inlet air temperature. It says 70. Watch this. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna grab the air temperature sensor. I'm gonna pop it off, just like that. And I'm gonna come over here. You notice it dives down and then brings back up. Really quick, I'm gonna hold the camera over here. Kinda of show that one more time. So I'll slide the sensor in while I'm stretching out my arm awkwardly. There we go. You know, sensor goes up to that area. When I unplug it, it's going to dip, dip, dip. All of a sudden it's going to say good and pop back up to a default value of 70. Now the same thing happens for every sensor. So a good example of this will also be my temperature sensor for coolant. You know, right now it's pulling 136. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to unplug it. <clears throat> Somehow. There we go. Wait for it. There we go. What it'll do is it'll sink and kind of lower and go to a default value. Now, that default value will get you started, won't exactly help you out too much. Okay? So just keep in mind, they always have this default value. The one we ran with is the KPA. So as soon as the engine started running, it would drop down. Now I'm in higher elevation, so 87 KPA is kind of my normal. It really stinks. But as soon as I started up the car or whatever, it always rang a default of like 36 KPA for this truck. We wasted forever trying to troubleshoot that before we finally noticed that the KPA wasn't changing when we gave it throttle. And I say forever, really it was like 30, 40 minutes. It felt like forever. But we could start it up and it idled great, but as soon as we started giving it gas, our, our truck would act funny and start stalling out. Our workaround, not knowing what we were doing, was to take the acceleration enrichment and just jack it up to the point where it was just dumping in fuel to compensate for the lack of an appropriate map sensor. So that's one thing you're gonna be looking for in troubleshooting. If you're installing Speed we know, make sure all your sensors are testing out right and everything's connected. Because if you have a loose wire somewhere in the rat's nest, it will cause you a little bit of a headache. It won't stop you. As you can see, those default values are still coming into play. But it will give you a headache when you're trying to tune things and you're just, you're going to a moving target. Actually, a non-moving target when it should be a moving target. All right, one more thing I wanna cover with sensors and kind of troubleshooting is making sure you've got your grounds right on all your sensors. Most every single one of your sensors is gonna function based on ground-based. Here's what I mean. I'm gonna use the inlet air temperature as a great example. So here we go. I've got a black wire and I've got an orange wire. There we go, that's them right there. This black wire is essentially my ground. That is a 12 volt or 14 volt, depending on when the car is running. And my orange wire is the signal wire that based on how much of this 12 volts goes in here, it runs through the resistor, whatever voltage and, well, sorry, resistance based that comes out of this orange wire in the ECU, Speedwino reads it, really dictates to what temperature this is seen here at the sensor. So why does that matter? Well. Here's a problem I ran. Back when I did Mega Squirt, this was a long time ago, the Mega Manual just specified ground out your sensor at a common place. Well, I grounded out my sensor at the same spot that I grounded out other areas of my engine bay. Well, why is that a problem? Well, there would be fluctuations. So, a noisy alternator, noisy anything, what would happen is my coolant temperature sensor would dive all over the place. It'd be one value when the engine wasn't re running and a slightly different value of about two degrees when the engine was running. If I had different RPMs, it would be slightly different through the range of RPMs. It was driving me nuts. At one point in time, I was getting really frustrated and I thought it was Megasquirt's fault. In all reality, it was just my wiring. So I ended up taking that ground wire, that black wire for the temperature sensor and I ran it all the way back to the Megasquirt and likewise with Speedwino, I grounded it back at the grounding pin that's on, on Speedwino, and this makes it rock solid. If the ECU is the one that's sending out the grounding signal for the sensor, it's also getting that same signal back, 
any variations in the voltage based on changes in the alternator, changes in anything and everything that happens in the car, electrical load, noise, anything. It's going to compensate for that and be rock solid. So a couple of key ones that you have to keep in mind as you're wiring that up is you want to make sure your TPS sensor goes back and grounds at the ECU. The air inlet temperature grounds at the ECU, the coolant temperature sensor grounds at the ECU. Basically all of your sensor inputs are grounding back at the ECU. The one exception to this that I use is my air fuel ratio. I don't ground my AFR wideband at my ECU. I ground that one at the same point in my ECU. So where my ECU has its main grounding point inside of the car, underneath the dash, my wideband also connects at that same point. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that you're going to run into. and. Uh, when it comes to the sensor side of things. I can talk forever on the, uh, the hall sensor or a VR sensor. Speedwino loves the hall sensor. I mean, absolutely loves it. But if you are running something like a BMW that uh, is kind of the older styles, the M20s, I um, uh, can't even think of the new engine block styles, but the E36 style, and uh, was it 54 or something like that? If you're running those, what you're going to notice in a lot of cases is the stock sensor is, it's a VR sensor. So uh, they don't bust as often, they, they really don't break, those things are bulletproof, but there's a lot more of a tuning set that you have to do because as the engine speed increases, the, uh, ultimately the voltage changes on those VR sensors. Whereas with a hall sensor, you just get 5 volts, no volts, 5 volts, no volts if it's a floating. Um, and that's kind of how it operates. And I'll talk a little bit more about that probably in the next video. Anyway, let me know if you have any thoughts, questions, anything else that I can dive into on my car. 